Right, everyone. So, um, welcome to the first in a series of lectures that I'm going to give. So, we'll see how they go. Um, and so, what these talks are going to be about is less about kind of fancy scientific ideas and more about how we actually can practically do science. And so, the first one today is going to be the principles of assessing energy balance and metabolic rate in mice. So, this is going to be about energy balance and metabolic rate. So I used to, I've given this talk for quite a while and the idea was to sort of suggest that this talk was now relevant because you couldn't get away with analyzing the energy expenditure of your mice in the way people had done for a very long time, 2012, uh, Chop et al. and Nature Methods, saying this is how we should do um, energy expenditure, energy balance, and calculate metabolic rate. And it's really good, but it's quite interesting that one of the authors on that paper had went back in 2019 to ask the question, had there been a lot of advances in terms of how people were doing it? And what they basically found was the thing which had basically both Andrew Butler, Les Kozak's paper, and also the CHOP paper had said you should not do, which is to simply express your energy expenditure as ratios, um, was still the predominant method of analyzing energy expenditure. So what do we mean by ratios? This is essentially going energy expenditure divided by body weight, or energy expenditure divided by body weight to the 0.75. And I'll mention that in a little bit, what that's about. Um, but it still turned out the majority of papers were not following the advice that had been laid out in this paper. And so I think that this talk is now less about saying you're going to have to do it, but maybe is still actually quite relevant to explain what you should be doing, really, if you want to think about energy balance and you want to think about metabolic rate. So the first thing to address is what is energy balance and what is metabolic rate and how do they differ? Because they are not the same thing and you need to choose which one you are thinking about dependent on your scientific question. And I would say there are two sort of major areas of research focus which use um, calorimetry within the Institute of Metabolic Science. And I would say the first one are the groups which are predominantly assessing why humans become obese. So assessing the molecular mechanisms controlling energy balance, and that's energy balance, why we get fat. Metabolic rate is subtly different. This is the unit tree energy expenditure of an organism. So if we think about a good example of this is, I do quite a lot of work on cold exposure. If I take the same mouse and I take it from room temperature to five degrees C, I will double its energy expenditure without changing its body weight. So that mouse will not necessarily get thinner or fatter. It may just eat more to compensate, but clearly there's something very different going on in an animal that's eating twice as much food and expending twice as much energy than one that is doing half as much. Okay, so energy balance describes whether an organism will lose or gain weight, and the size of the organism is completely irrelevant for considering energy balance. So if we have a 30 gram mouse, it, you put 31 grams of food into it, and the, only the equivalent of 30 grams of food comes out, you will get a 31 gram mouse. It will gain weight. Conversely, if we have a one ton elephant, and we put one ton and one gram of food in, and one ton of energy comes out, we will get a one ton and one gram elephant. It will have gained weight. In this case, we do not care in this setting how big the organism is when we are assessing energy balance, why things get fat. Obviously, the rate of weight change will be quite radically different as a proportion of the mouse. So the mouse will gain weight very rapidly if it's gaining one gram over a set time period relative to the elephant, which will only slowly increment in weight. So this is really a technical issue because it's pretty hard to get a set of scales that are gonna accurately measure one ton and one gram versus 30 and 31 grams. Metabolic rate, the size of the organ, is extremely important as we care about the rate of energy expenditure per gram. So 30 gram mouse, five grams of food in, five grams of energy out, same time period, I've already mentioned this was cold exposure, seven grams of food in, seven grams of energy out. And literally, if you consider the temperature ranges we can work with in the IMS, we can go from probably, I would argue, for a 30 gram mouse, two and a half to three grams of breeder's chow, up to easily seven grams. So we can really ramp up metabolic rate, and the best way of doing that is by just altering the environmental temperature of the animals. So how are we going to measure these different things? Food intake, energy balance, and metabolic rate. 
Okay, so to assess metabolic rate and energy balance, we need three pieces of information. The body weight of the animal, the amount of food it has consumed, and how much energy is it, it has expended. And so the key point here about this is, for metabolic rate, we actually need two of these. We need the body weight of the animal, and either the amount of food it has consumed or how much energy is expended. It is actually possible to calculate the metabolic rate of an animal without a calorimeter, just by measuring food intake really well. And I'll show you how that's done in the next talk. You will see by the end of the talk, the major reason you wanna use a calorimeter if you're introduced, interested in metabolic rate rather than food intake is it is miles less work and miles easy to, easier to use a calorimeter. For energy balance, we also need two of these three pieces of information. In that case, we need to know the amount of food the animal has consumed, and that correctly should be the amount it has assimilated, but also how much energy it has expended. And we subtract one from the other, and then we can work out whether it's gained or lost weight. So how to measure food intake and body weight? Weighing scales. That's that simple. Now, there are some niceties to it, particularly for food intake, and we'll, come, and we'll do those next lecture, but yeah, you're using weighing scales. And how to measure energy expenditure, on the other hand, there are a variety of methods, and we'll go through some, of, uh, some older methods which are perhaps not used so commonly anymore. We'll also mention two indirect methods, one which we do routinely in the Institute of Metabolic Science, and another one which is super useful, but we do not do, and I'll explain why this one's so useful. So the first one is direct calorimetry. So the purpose of a calorimeter is to measure heat. And a direct calorimeter measures heat directly. By, and in order to do so, what you do is you put whatever you want to measure the energy expenditure of, the calorie production of, into a sealed chamber, the measuring cell, which is the calorimeter, you then have a heat sensing material and historically the, the material that was used was ice. And the reason for this is that the amount of energy required to convert ice into water is extremely well established. So you could just measure how much ice got melted and that would tell you how much energy was produced. And it was super accurate. You then have to shield your heat sensing material, your ice from the outside environment. So no heat from the outside can get in. And that is a device called an adiabatic shield. Most commonly, again, it was just another layer of ice. So this was invented in the 18th century, direct calorimeters. The advantage of them is they really are the most accurate method. They do exactly what it says on the tin. However, the big disadvantage is that it's a sealed unit. And so it has an incredibly limited time scale for experiments, but they have been used in both animal and human studies. They're still used for some animal studies where you are looking at animals with incredibly low metabolic rates. So things like hibernating sea turtles have such low metabolic rates that these kind of technologies are actually applicable. The second method I'll briefly mention is doubly labeled water. You know, you may have heard about it in the literature, but um, I and I think it's possible we have capacity to do this in the IMS being set up with through Michelle Venables. And the way this works is it relies on the fact that oxygen and hydrogen can be excreted from the body in two different routes. So what you do is you have an input dose of water which has both deuterium and oxygen 18 labels. This will then equilibrate with the body water. So usually in humans, they just drink it. In mice, it will be done by injection. It will equilibrate with the body water, but then the hydrogen can only be removed from the body as water. However, oxygen can be removed from the water as from the body as both water and carbon dioxide. So if you can calculate the oxygen elimination rate and the hydrogen elimination rate, and that's usually repeat sampling. In humans, you might use urine. In rodents, you would use blood. You can then calculate the carbon dioxide production. And so this would be an example of simply the decay rates of um, the isotopes over time with the faster removal being for oxygen because it's going out through two routes and the slower being for hydrogen because it can only go out via one route. And the difference in the slopes of these lines would be proportionate to the carbon dioxide production. And carbon dioxide production by the body is a good substitute for energy expenditure. It has about a 6% error. And we're gonna come on to that in a second. If you are interested in doubly labeled water, I will recommend this book, Doubly Labeled Water, Theory and Practice by John Speakman. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the most common method of measuring energy expenditure, which is indirect calorimetry. 
am. This is true in both mice and humans. It can be used in a variety of different modes. Generally, we use um, calorimetry cages in rodents. In humans, you may have calorimeters, which are whole room calorimeters, or they may be ventilated hoods, which requires the person to remain still, or they could be masks, which are really useful for things like exercise calorimetry. So you have someone on an exercise bike wearing a mask. So what is an indirect calorimeter? Well, it measures heat, but it does so indirectly. And the way it measures the heat indirectly is by assessing gas exchange. So you have a box, you pump air in or suck air out at a known flow rate. And from those, you can calculate the amount of oxygen this little mouse is consuming and the amount of carbon dioxide it's producing. Okay. Now, it's important to note this chamber does not have zero volume, okay? And so therefore, all calorimetry experiments will have a component which is known as calorimetric lag. So the numbers your calorimeter is spitting out, unless they've had some form of correction applied to them, will represent a weighted average of a period of time prior to your measurement. And so you can see the volume of the chamber matters because if we have a flow rate of air into the calorimeter, say, of 400 milliliters per minute, um, and this is the time in minutes, if we have smaller chambers, 6.2 liters, it maybe only takes 20 minutes for us to get to be able to observe nearly all of the energy expenditure that the mouse is producing. So if we imagine we put our mouse in at time zero, it's going to take us 20 minutes until we get to being able to observe the fraction of the energy expenditure getting up to about one. If we look, say, at four, two or four minutes, we might see an energy expenditure that was only 20 or 40% of what the mouse was actually doing because it's taking time for the oxygen the mouse is consuming and the carbon dioxide to equilibrate within the chamber. Now, as calorimeters have developed, people have developed larger and larger chambers so they can put in more environmental enrichment and make them feel nicer for the mice. This 2.7 liter chamber in purple was the very old first calorimeter we had, which was um, the Columbus Oximax system. It had a wire mesh floor. The data you got out of it bore very little resemblance to anything that the mouse would actually be doing in normal life. By the time we get up to 10 liters here, this is actually the home cage that the mice live in, one of the Technoplast home cages. But you can see even at an hour, we're still only reaching about 85% of the measured energy expenditure um, based on um, the, ex the mixing of the gas within the chamber. And this is really important because if you want to do blood sampling halfway through your calorimetry run, for example, you need to understand there'll be a period of time after you've taken your blood sample that your data is not going to necessarily reflect the actual energy expenditure of the mouse. Okay. You can try and correct for lag. So what you can do is you can basically derivatize this slope. And then if you derivatize these perfect um, idealized curves that I've generated, you will get this nice flat red line. Okay. But this kind of correction has a problem in that it tends to lead to an amplification and an overshoot. So this is an experiment where we were infusing a gas mix, which was supposed to return 38 joules per minute. Um, and in blue was what we actually observed. I had to open the chamber here briefly for some reason. Then we pootle along. And then at this point here, we double, we increase the infusion by 50% up to about 60 joules per minute. And then you can see the lag correction that's been applied in purple. And what we see here is we get points where we overshoot the observed value. So it works very nicely here. We get up to our, what we're sort of aiming for in terms of energy expenditure. But you need to be careful with lag correction because you'll introduce noise. Okay, so what is energy expenditure and how do we relate it to the amount of carbon dioxide that's being produced by the mouse and the amount of oxygen that's being consumed? So um, the calorimeter will spit out your VO2 and your VOCO2 and it will convert these numbers into energy expenditure using this equation. And it roughly boils down to three quarters oxygen uh, consumption, one quarter carbon dioxide production. I'm gonna explain why it's three quarters oxygen consumption and one quarter carbon dioxide production over the next few slides. So the reason for this is the oxygen consumption gives an indication of how much energy an animal is using as an animal produces 4.8 kilojoules of energy per liter of oxygen with an error rate of around 6%. 
Carbon dioxide production is not in a one-to-one -one ratio with oxygen consumption, and the amount of carbon dioxide produced will vary dependent on the source of the energy, whether it's carbohydrate, fat, or protein. And so, and then we can derive a further variable by combining the amount of oxygen consumed and the amount of CO2 produced to give us a value called the RQ or RER, and that provides us some information about fuel usage. And the RQ varies from about 0.7 to 1, depending on the metabolic status of the animal. Okay, so what we know is that the carbon dioxide can therefore vary in ratio to the oxygen by about 30%. And 75% of the energy expenditure equation is driven by the VO2, 25% is driven by the VCO2, which varies from equaling oxygen by, plus, by up to 30%. 25% of 30 is about 6%, and that's the error based on using O2 alone. And the reason why we get this variation in the amount of energy is depends whether we're using carbohydrates or whether we are using fat. If you're burning pure carbs, you can just basically, oxygen, VO2 and VCO2 will match perfectly. Whereas if you're burning fat, VCO2, pure fat, VCO2 will be 30% uh, lower than VO2. And the reason for this is as follows. How does RQ work? So RQ is VCO2 over VO2. And burning carbohydrate has an RQ of one because carbohydrate, and this is a unit of carbohydrate, it normally comes in ring structures of um, six carbons, but in this case, the basic unit is a carbon with an oxygen and two hydrogens, hence carbohydrate. To fully oxidize that into carbon dioxide and water, you're gonna need one molecule of um, oxygen. So two oxygen atoms, one molecule of oxygen, and that will produce you one molecule of carbon dioxide and one molecule of water. So therefore, the ratio is one to one. Fat, on the other hand, has an RQ of 0.7, and that is because this is our basic unit of fat. It is a carbon with two hydrogens bond to it. It's usually found in chains of 16 to 20 carbons in length. Um, there may be some double bonds in it, but essentially this is the basic unit. And to fully oxidize that to carbon dioxide and water, what you're gonna need is you're gonna need one and a half molecules of oxygen. So, we have one over 1.5, which gives us about 0.7. It's not 0.66 because every molecule of fat, it's a fatty acid, it has a carboxyl group with a couple of oxygens in it. And so that pushes the RQ up to about 0.7 for full fat oxidation. And as I say, if you are interested, there will be a talk uh, exclusively about respiratory quotient in a few weeks. However, what it basically means is as follows. It gives us some information about substrate utilization. So it can tell us if we have a low RQ, our mouse is probably oxidizing a lot of fat. If we've got a high RQ, it's probably oxidizing more carbohydrates, maybe some protein. And it can even exceed one in rodents during periods of lipogenesis, as lipogenesis, turning carbohydrate into fat, has an RQ of about five. So if ever you see papers where they've calculated carbohydrate oxidation, um, and they come out with negative numbers, or they, sorry, or they've calculated fat oxidation, and they come out with a negative number, it's because the RQ is pushed above one, and it's pushed above one because they're doing um, lipogenesis. Okay, so we're going to come on now to having discussed essentially respiratory quotient, how calorimeters work in principle. We're going to move on to the section where we really look at metabolic rate. So in terms of energy balance, we need to know the energy expenditure, the food intake, and be able to balance them. But in order to calculate metabolic rate, we need to know about body weight and how we're going to integrate that into our calorimetry data. Okay. So the first point, and it's one that is missed in the literature and is still missed a lot, is that a large mouse will expend more energy than a small mouse. Now, this seems obvious and it seems kind of intuitive if we think about it because like humans are bigger than mice, we expend way more energy and equally mice that are bigger than smaller mice will expend more energy because there's more metabolic mass. And in particular with mice, there's more metabolic ma mass to heat. So this relationship between body weight and energy expenditure gets stronger the lower you go in terms of temperature. Now, why I say it's a little bit confused in the literature is very often, and this was really true historically, it's still certainly not true, people would divide their energy expenditure by their body weight, and then they would come out with the conclusion that obese mice were getting fat because they were expending less energy. Actually, 
that's kind of almost never the case. It's almost always the case that a larger mouse will have a larger absolute energy expenditure if we look over on the y-axis than a smaller mouse. Second point is that larger mice will eat more energy than smaller mice. So if you are bigger, you are going to need more food. And so this is some food intake data, um, which was co collected over eight days. And you can see an extremely good correlation between how big the mouse was and how much energy it ate. And another important point, and I mentioned this in the previous talk, is that it's really important when you study your mouse. Because if you are trying to work out why mouse group a here is fatter than mouse group B. If you study it here, what you can see is over the period of time we are looking, these lines are parallel, i.e. they were not diverging in body weight. So if you do an energy balance equation, you will find because these mice are gaining weight at the same rate as these, that they will have the same energy balance and you will not be able to determine why this mouse group is fatter than this. What you need to do is study them here at the period when they're diverging to work out whether it was increased energy expenditure in this group or decreased energy expenditure or more food intake that was driving the differential in body weight. Okay. So going back to hammer this point home, it's not just larger mice, it's also fatter mice will usually expend more energy than thin mice. And this is because fatter mice are bigger and fat does not have a metabolic rate of zero. So this can cause a lot of confusion because when we come then to look at our raw calorimetry data and we've got our mice and they're obese and we look at them and we find that when we look at our raw data, our obese animals are spending more energy. And this seems counterintuitive. Um, because if my genotype has made my mouse fat, well, then why is it now causing them to expend more energy? That should surely make them thinner. So really, the critical question here is, we need to know if our animal has disproportionately low energy expenditure for its body weight, i.e., yes, our mouse is bigger, and it's expending more energy, but should it be expending even more energy in order for it to stay lean? So that's the question. And so then the next section is, how do we go about doing that? How to normalize for body weight. So traditionally, people have used a whole variety of different comparators and are still doing, and these are most commonly ratios. So a particularly common comparator is body weight to the 0.75. So you take your energy expenditure and you divide it by your body weight, but you raise your body weight to the power of 0.75. Um, However, this, along with body weight to the 0.72 and body weight to the 0.66, were developed for comparing across species, i.e. elephants and mice, rather than within species. And the evidence really suggests that these are not valid comparators for comparing within species, in particular mice, where you're comparing lean animals with obese animals. They really don't work because this relationship does not hold true. So if we describe our oxygen consumption as milliliters per minute per kilogram to the 0.75, it's not a good idea. So is there a better method? And the method that Chop et al. put forward in 2012, and it had been suggested way back, um, I think in the late 1970s by Gene Hems-Hagen, might be the first person to have done it, is ANCOVA. Okay, so what is ANCOVA? So you'll see it written in papers, and you'll see people suggesting how to do it. It is really breathtakingly simple. The principle behind ANCOVA is you take your two pieces of information you were going to do your ratio, body weight to the 0.75 with, and you do not make any assumptions about their relationship. You plot them on a scatter plot. So you put the body weight along the x-axis and the energy expenditure along the y-axis. And this can be the average energy expenditure of your entire calorimetry run. So you might have been spat out with 200 or even 2,000 energy expenditure values for one mouse. You just average them. And that gives you your average energy expenditure during your run. Um, you can break it down into pieces, but taking an overall 48-hour energy expenditure is perfectly valid. And you, so you plot that on the y-axis, and you plot the body weight or the lean mass on the x-axis. And I, I'm not going to go into that today because I'm really not 100% sure what the correct x-axis is, whether the lean mass or um, body weight is the best one. I actually think it varies dependent on your question. And I think I would discuss that with anyone who was interested separately. But anyhow, what you do is you plot them. And the idea is, if you have a group with increased oxygen consumption or increased energy expenditure per animal, 
the red dots, if we put their regression line, and then the blue dots, which has the lower energy expenditure, we put their regression line, there will be a gap between them. So ideally they will be parallel or approximate parallel, but they will be offset in terms of their um, intercepts. Conversely, if we look at this group, all the red mice on the y-axis, which is the energy expenditure, are higher than all the blue mice, which are also on the y-axis. So they have higher energy expenditure, but they are also bigger. But in this case, we can see that the regression slopes we have for these mice run on a continuum. In other words, they are not offset, they run as a single line, and therefore these two groups have the same metabolic rate. The only reason the group with red dots has higher energy expenditure than the group with blue dots is because they are bigger mice, and there is more mouse, and therefore there is more energy being expended. Obviously, you will pretty much never get the situation where the regression lines are exactly the same. And what ANCOVER essentially does is it plots a weighted average regression line for both groups of animals. And then what it's going to do is it's going to slide each animal down this to uh, the same body weight, and then it's going to compare them. And the test it uses is um, essentially a t-test. So how about some real data? So just to show you the kind of data we put in, this is incredibly old, this is from my PhD thesis, and this is just using oxygen in milliliters per minute per mile. So this is the average of the whole run, wild types and knockouts, and then this is the body weight, and it's the average body weight. That is it. So when you're talking about how do I normalize for metabolic rate, and you hear the term, oh, you should use ANCOVA, this is the data you're gonna need. What's your group, wild type, knockout, drug treatment, not treated, what is the energy expenditure in this case? I've, I'd not learned sufficiently. I was still using oxygen consumption. So this has a 6% error in it. And then I also have body weight. Okay, that's it. That's all you need. And if in this case, I'd used a traditional milliliters per minute per kilogram and concluded there was no difference between my wild types and my knockouts in terms of their metabolic rate. I was told to go away and do it properly. And so I ran the ANCOVA. And so what we essentially find, and there are some important bits here, so this is just a spit out from SPSS, but I just wanna highlight some things here. So the first thing is, it, this table tells us whether things are significant. Firstly, as we've included mass body weight as a covariate, it needs to be significant. For ANCOVA to work, there has to be a significant relationship between body weight and energy expenditure, otherwise you can't run it. So in this case, mass was significant, p of 0 0.0, of 0 0.047, and the genotype was also significant, p of 0 0.01. So that was quite nice. Um, now, what we then get spat out of the software is a variable called the estimated marginal mean. And what this does is it calculates our energy expenditure if, as if all the mice had the same weight. And in SPSS's case, what it does is it takes the average body weight of all the animals. So the average of this column, and that is the body weight it calculates it to. So it goes to 33.36 grams. And so it says genotype one, if it, all of those mice weighed 33.36 grams, it would give me 2.269 milliliters per minute of oxygen. And there's our standard error. And genotype two, the knockouts would only be two milliliters per minute. There's our standard error. Now, we have to check our model is valid, and one of the important things we have to do is check that these lines are not significantly different from each other. Interestingly, if they are, that is a result. It may actually suggest that there's an alteration in thermogenic function in the animals, but when the regression lines are not equal and cross in the area of interest, formally you cannot run an ANCOVA. Then you have to basically talk about your interaction as a result. So what we need to do is check that these lines are not significantly different from each other. And that gives us a whole P of 0 0.95 to fit into. So usually you're, you're pretty much okay. So what we do in order to do that is, so this is our original model where we have mass and genotype. We include an interaction term. We include, the type, include genotype times mass. And so what this does is it allows us to have separate lines and this P value tells us are those lines statistically significantly different. And if they are statistically significantly different, then you can't run the ANCOVA. So what you do in that case, you go back to showing your plots, 
with your X and your Y axis in your paper, and you probably just show the average of the unnormalized energy expenditure, and then you have to kind of discuss it. But assuming, as in this case, everything is valid, in our model, which does not include the interaction, we have a significant effect of mass, and we have a significant effect of genotype. In our model, which does include the interaction, the genotype times mass term is not significant. And by the way, note these genotype and mass values are now no longer significant when we've included the interaction, but these are not valid in the context of ANCOVA as p-values. It is the ones that come out of the model where we have not included the genotype times mass term that are the valid p-values. And so now we have to report it. Uh, and in this case, reporting my lovely and now significant results. So this is text from my thesis. And it simply says oxygen consumption rates from seven month old mice fed a standard laboratory chow, data collected from free living mice, ad libitum access to food over a period of 48 hours. N equals eight group chow diet, oxygen consumption expressed as adjusted means based on a normalized mouse weight of 33.36 grams determined using ANCOVA. And so you just report oxygen consumption milliliters per minute. And nowadays, as it's become more familiar, this level of text in a figure legend is not necessary, but this is from a thesis. So, you know, you can put in a lot more. Okay, so now we're gonna come on to this. I mentioned very early on in the talk that the majority of papers are still using ratios, and I've said they're bad. So the question I now need to do is show you why there is a problem with ratios. And it relates to the following. It relates to the fact that the intercept of the relationship between body weight and energy expenditure is not zero. It does not cut through the origin. In fact, in this case, it is cutting through at 9.4 joules per minute. So that is saying that at zero grams, this regression line would cut through at 9.4 joules per minute. Not true, but that's just simply reflecting the fact that as the mass changes, you're going to have a different relationship in terms of how much energy increments. Okay, so what happens, what are we doing when we take a ratio? What are we formally doing in terms of the mass when we divide by body weight? Well, what we're effectively doing is calculating the slopes of these two lines. That's what we're doing. And we are assuming that they will cut through zero. So essentially, when we take our energy expenditure divided by body weight, it's this slope with a zero intercept. What you can see here immediately, I've taken a, a point off this top end of this line and a point off the bottom end of this line is that these slopes are different. And yet, in fact, these animals have the same metabolic rate. And if we extend this ad absurdum, um, you can see if we go down to say a five gram mouse, which is not very plausible, we would cons uh, consider this animal to have probably around about two and a half times the metabolic rate, even though it's still continuing on the same regression slope. And actually, you can get perfectly reasonable mice running around the 12 grams, and you can get perfectly reasonable mice running around the 50 or 60 grams. Um, so this isn't quite as trivial as it sounds. And so the problem is, if you have a whole bunch of mice up here and a whole bunch of mice down here, because these ones are fatter than these ones, you may well then calculate that the slopes for this lot are all much shallower than these, and therefore their energy expenditure per gram is lower and it is not. And so that is what has led to a lot of the confusion in the literature. It also le leads to problems the other way. So this one kind of makes people assume obese mice are hypometabolic when often they're not. And if we go the other way, you also get the assumption that runty mice are hypo hypermetabolic. And that could be true in some cases, but in many cases, it's because you've just divided by body weight and you've effectively done this slope. Those are the normal ones and those are the obese ones. So other types of data from metabolic caging systems, and we are coming towards the end of today's talk. Um, so what else can we get out? Okay, so delta body weight. So this is super, super important. If you do work with the DMC, they will do this automatically. And this is to measure the weight of your mice out of the calorimeter and the measure the weight in. So quite frequently I get asked to analyze data by people and, um, they will say, I've measured the weight of the mice going in because the, the machine asks for it, but they won't have measured it coming out. And it's really important for understanding respiratory quotient and obviously for understanding energy balance. If you've got some calorimetry data for 48 hours and you've got some food intake in that time from the calorimeter and you've got your energy expenditure from the calorimeter, you need to know whether the mouse gained or lost weight in that time 
in order to be able to do the energy balance calculations. You also need it to understand RQ because we'll see in the third lecture that really RQ is tremendously heavily um, driven by differentials in body weight, delta body weight. And this is because mice in negative energy balance will almost always have lower RQ values because they will be oxidizing their own fat reserves, which has an RQ of 0.7. And whereas mice in positive energy balance will be storing all the fat they're eating and oxidizing more carbohydrate than is actually in their diet. We'll come on and look at that in um, more clarity. Activity. So activity can, is basically can be slightly problematic because it makes up a really quite a small component of the mouse's energy budget. And this is particularly true below thermal neutrality. And so it has a very small or no effect on observed energy expenditure. So if you see small changes in activity, they're very unlikely to explain any differences in energy expenditure you would detect as significant on a group of eight. If you have hundreds of mice, maybe you can then use differences in activity. Obviously, if you have three or four-fold differences in activity because the mice are circling, for example, they've got some problems with their ears, then that can show up in energy expenditure or you've got like running wheels in there, you might see some energy expenditure increments. But with the kind of beam break stuff in the cages that we're very often using, activity is generally has a pretty low impact on energy expenditure in these cages. Importantly, though, it will be highly correlated with energy expenditure because the mice will be more active when their energy expenditure is higher. So water intake. So water intake is a good variable to get um, because it will provide you with information if you have diabetic mice. And actually, you can see quite subtle increases in water intake with mice with kidney function. We had some NAKT2 knockout mice, and we found they were drinking more water. And I went to the literature, and I found out this is a known phenotype because AKT2 has roles in the kidney and is necessary for full water reabsorption. In general, it's not a variable that we are particularly interested in in energy balance for obesity. However, a dramatic loss in weight in one of your mice may actually be more to do with the failure to drink, and that can kick out things like your understanding of how delta body weight connects to food intake or respiratory quotient, because actually you're now talking about a loss of water, which is not an energy source, rather than a loss of fat mass, which is what you're hoping to really be picking up with any changes in body weight or a loss in glycogen storage. So it's important to check. So I mentioned earlier that we shouldn't really talk about food intake, but we should talk more about um, food that is absorbed into the animal. So, um, and this is a process called gut assimilation efficiency. Not all the food that is consumed um, will be absorbed by the body in either mice or humans. So mice generally operate in the mid to high 80s range for assimilation efficiency. They're pretty good. They absorb most of the nutrients they take in, but there will still be some in the feces. And generally, the technique used to assess assimilation efficiency um, would be a bomb calorimeter, which the DMC has. I'm not sure when it's going to be set up. So you can actually get differences in body weight in mice being set up even though they're and you do it properly and they're eating exactly the same amount of food and they're expending exactly the same amount of energy and yet you are finding one group is getting fatter than the other it could be a gastrointestinal phenotype and so it's just worth bearing in that in mind okay so this is the final slide just some conclusions and take-home messages so energy balance describes the process by which animals humans mice whatever get fat and that is independent of the actual weight of the organism. For that, you want to know how much weight it's gained over the period you're interested in, how much food has gone into the organism, and how much energy has come out. And from that, you can then work out, is what's different between my group energy expenditure? Should I go looking at processes that regulate energy expenditure to explain why my group is fatter or thinner? Or should I be looking at processes that regulate food intake? Or maybe even processes that regulate gut if you've gone to the lengths of doing bomb calorimetry? Metabolic rate describes the unitary mass energy expenditure. So you can have identical weight mice, study grams, but they can have very different amounts of energy they're expending because of different factors. So a classic one I've already mentioned is environmental temperature. But actually, if you've got a mouse that's bald, and a classic one here is the SCD1 knockout, you can actually get 30% higher energy expenditure at room temperature just because the mouse has lost all its fur. And mice with different fur quality, like um, FVBNs, have higher metabolic rates than C57 black sixes because their fur's a bit thinner. 
um, and their skin's not as good, and so they expend more energy. So assessing these variables accurately is really essential for determining why your, mass, your mouse is obese, why your mouse is lean, or why it has altered metabolic function. And so we've really covered like energy expenditure and how to calculate metabolic rate today. And the next talk, we're going to move on to food intake, which is actually quite a bit more complicated. Okay, so thank you very much. And I am now happy to take questions for the next 10 minutes.